welcome. Very melodramatic uh, beginning to the fourth, I think it's the fourth one, the fourth uh, quarantine happy hour. This one, especially for all the European uh, listeners and fans out there, it's um, quarantine o'clock for you guys here in New Orleans. It's a bit early for that, so instead of a, I've, I've still got a quarantine glass, but she who must be obeyed at all times. There's maybe a nice pot of tea. So this is a quarant. I guess it's a quarantine instead of a quarantine. Anyway, I'm all ready. And this one is dedicated to my cousin Daisy, who just gave birth to a baby boy. Yay. Congratulations! Well, everybody in the family is very happy. So, um, thank you for tuning in. If indeed there's anybody out there. And um, the idea here is to just basically play some piano, fool around, invite you in. If anybody's got any uh, questions or is curious about a song or some aspects of how the music works, then by all means, type in a message and um, I'll see if I can come up with a, an enlightening answer. W would you like an inside joke comment? An inside joke it, comment, It's yes. from Fleur. She says, give us your best Lawrence Welk, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Welk. The Lawrence Welk reference, that's an in-joke that probably won't be uh, understood by uh, by the Euro audiences. But hey, Fleur, how are you? Cool. Any questions that come in? She uh, who must be obeyed at all times is manning the controls. So what you got? Okay, here's, here's some um, from Carla Blanc. Carla. Yeah. Blanc, not Carl LeBlanc, oh, but he... Carla Blanc. Yeah. Uh, she has a few, so uh, let's see. Inside, outside. I'm not sure what this one means. Maybe you will. Do you use inside, outside, and is it something you hear in New Orleans music? I don't know what that question no? means, Okay, I'm let's afraid. go on to our second one. Yeah. How do you adapt your playing with a guitarist and what you are looking for in him or her, and what do you look for in a musician when you are looking to play with someone, like a drummer or a bass player, et cetera? Um, okay, some good questions there uh, from Carla Blanc. And it's funny because there's a Carla Blanc in New Orleans too, but it's Carl LeBlanc. <laughs> He's a really good uh, guitar player here in New Orleans. Um, so good questions about what you look for in a musician if you're going to play with them, if you're going to accompany somebody. Well, I think you want to uh, look for some of those qualities that you'd hope to find in anybody, really. You want to find someone that's kind of generous, someone that listens, and that um, uh, is sympathetic to what you're doing and is thinking about what they might do to make your stuff work better. Those are all nice qualities in general, really. Uh, if you're playing with another musician, you know, you have... Um, to be generous and leave some space and leave some stuff out. And if you're playing with a guitar player, you have, uh, as a piano player at least anyway, you have a wider range you can choose from. A guitar operates in this kind of range. But here on the piano, you can go all the way down to there and all the way up to here. Um, I play, sometimes I do duo gigs with John Schofield, and when John plays, is just by himself, it sounds like an orchestra, full, big, sonic picture and big range. But um, John's ability to conjure up um, beautiful colors when he's stretching out and improvising and making stuff up um, sometimes means that my job is to basically just stay in the groove and, get, and just to keep a pocket down here. You know. <laughs> try not to get too busy in that region because that's where he'll be playing so um, if I take care of the bass you know <laughs> this tune I'm playing is an example is a Mahalia Jackson tune that um, that we cut on a record called Piety Street 
uh, about 15 years ago, I suppose, 10 years ago, something like that. Um. <laughs> I try, and keep, I try and keep it pretty defined. And you're really the, the workhorse, you're the engine, and the guitar is uh, soloing, so you, you basically provide a nice um, set of um, rhythmic textures with dynamics and power and drive, and you're the engine, really. So that's an example of what I would play if I was a company guitar player. Now, sometimes other guitar players might play a different thing and then your job is different, but it really depends on the individual and the material. All right. that answers your question. Here's a good question. John yeah. Fleming says, please funkify a non-funk song. Say, God save the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Let's see you do that. <laughs> so I've got to try and remember how God save the queen goes. That's probably not the best example because I can't remember how God Save the Queen goes. Sorry, Queenie. Um, but funking up a straight tune, yeah, you can do that. That's half the point, really. I think back in the... That's a really good question as relates to where we are here. We're, for anybody that's not aware of this, we're right in New Orleans in Louisiana. Um, yeah, and. Oh, that was Here Comes the Bride. Oh, that was God Save the Queen. No, that was that. Here Comes the Bride. Oh, okay. I've I just funked up. Here Comes the, the Bride. Crystals in my head now. Oh, and it was God. 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 <laughs> Something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. muddled up. Um, anyway, I was about to make a point, because this is actually a good question. And what made, what happened here in New Orleans, and I'm speaking very broad strokes here, but what happened in the early 20th century here that made all the difference to the way popular music was played through the 20th century was that they took fairly straight tunes, and they did precisely that. They played them funky. Ba, 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 ba. This is an example I've heard used a couple of times, but songs like do ba 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 take the melody and then you improvise around it. You take the essential ingredients and then you rag it. You, uh, you anticipate some notes 
you add grace notes in other places, and um, you imbue a good melody, an already good melody, with some extra flavors. And it's like putting, adding hot sauce or putting vinegar on your fish and chips. Here's one from Linda Porter. Linda. Um, oh. She <laughs> says, uh, well, she's, it's, she's very happy. Loving this. Think it's brilliant. Request, please. Young Boy Blues. Young Boy Blues. Okay, Young Boy Blues. I'm not even really sure who wrote Young Boy Hold on, I'm just having a little sip of tea. Quarantine. Young Boy Blues was by Benny King. I used to play it with Snooks Eaglin. And I was surprised when I found the Benny E. King version that it's credited to Phil Spector, which sounds a bit suspect to me. I don't know if Phil Spector actually really wrote this. I'm not really sure who wrote it. But anyway, my knowledge of this song is from Snooks Eaglin. I'm a bit <clears throat> still a bit early, so I'm a bit croaky, so I'm going to change to drop the key down and see if this works. Every time I kiss somebody new Make believe I'm kissing you, baby I can't keep my aching heart My heart knows we're still apart Each night is like A thousand years, baby I can't lose these young boy blues Don't know where to go Time I kiss somebody new Make believe I'm kissing you And I I can't keep my aching heart now My heart know we're still apart Each night is like A thousand years oh, oh, oh. I can't lose this Young boy blue you hear me when I'm crying, baby Each night is like A thousand years Oh, baby I can't lose Young boy Especially for Linda. Hi, Linda. Um, Felix Elliott Greenberg II says, what's your go-to chord extension? Chord extension. I wonder what that means by chord extension. Well, you can extend any chord, really. A chord by itself, in its most basic form, is really three notes. I guess you could call two notes a chord. But really, a major chord consists of three notes. In this case, we're playing C major. It consists of C, E natural, and G natural. The first, the third, and the fifth note of the major scale of C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. So there it is. Now you can take that. That's your sort of meat and potatoes. And then, um, a bit like we were talking about with the last thing, you can then add flavors to it. So you can add all sorts of things to it. You can go. start getting out to the point where some things are kind of pretty out of tune but they sound right and um, my go-to extension well uh, go to chord extension well one chord I find I like to sit down and play sometimes I play this when I first sit down at the piano because it's a bit like to me it's like opening the door to a to a, a mysterious room and this, in this case, it's called A half diminished, and it sounds like this. I like 
that because it's loaded with information and is really a suspended chord. It holds you in suspense because the information it gives you is that something is about to happen and you have an intimation of what it is and when you actually give the listener that chord, it's almost like a little reward. But what happens is the chord you give them is also loaded with information. This note here. And this note here. Because you can then suggest that they're going to drop down to this. And if you want, you can keep going. So when you play chords, when you extend a chord or add to a chord, you do it basically because you're um, about to, to do something. It's, 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 it's a signal of intent. Um, and trained musicians will recognize the toolbox and the, what, you're, what you're doing, but the point is to do them so, uh, in such a fashion that people who are not musicians necessarily will still feel that thing even if they couldn't if they couldn't uh, explain what it is or put their finger on it um, it's the same thing that makes a blues when you go there you are now you've, suggest, now you've announced um, that something's going to happen you waved a big flag and then you reward the listener when he goes there and you set up another one note has to go what's clever though sometimes with composition is that you can suggest that you're going somewhere and you build up a sense of anticipation and the listeners all geared up and they know where it's going to go and then it doesn't go there it's a bit like a clever um, a clever twist in a plot of a thriller and you can suggest that you're going to go somewhere and then go somewhere else before you get there well, there's all kinds of little tricks you can use but you basically draw the listener in in the same way as a good writer would write the first few pages of a book even the first sentence such that you're compelled to keep going that's the idea uh, Joe O'Callaghan says can you show the intro of Burnt Mouth Boogie yeah <laughs> Just a title for whatever I feel like playing, but it always kind of starts with that that little thing. That Sonny Barksdale. Hey, says, Sonny, how are you, man? Says, Sonny is one of the regulars at my gig at Chicky Wawa on a Tuesday night. And um, since we've all been in lockdown, this is the new version of being... A, <laughs> well, that's not this time, but um, Sonny's one of the... Fa as a face uh, I see every Tuesday, a really nice cat. Hey, Sonny. How so are you, mate? He says, um, Fess like Perez Prado, you like him too. What was unique about his playing? Perez Prado, for those who don't know, Perez Prado is most famous as being the face of the mambo for white American audiences in the 1950s, into the 1960s. And he led a big band and appeared in films and made hit records. Um, Cherry Blossom Pink and Apple White was one of them. Patricia is another one, which got used on a 
on a Guinness advert. That's my favorite recently. one. <laughs> <laughs> Something he wrote about sheep who must be obeyed at all times. Um, and um, <clears throat> what people, a lot of people don't know is that he was a really good piano player uh, from Cuba. Um, Benny Moray was the singer in his band for several years when they were based out of Mexico City. And um, Prez Prado's um, piano playing kind of took a back seat to his organ playing in later years. And he's, um, there's a certain kind of, it, it became, it was considered pretty, I mean, you listen to, they're really great records, but it was considered the epitome of cheese, really. <laughs> it was very cheesy later on. Uh, which I think is why it was used to such good effect in the Guinness advert. But he was a good piano player, and there's one of his I really like. Um, he had a real funky band, big mambo orchestra. He was billed as the king of the mambo, though sometimes Tito Puente claimed that, and Tito Rodriguez did too. And Cachao was considered to be the inventor of the mambo, but Pres Prado claimed to be the king of, of the mambo and the piano kind of occasionally featured in those records but not, more often than not if you ever see film of him he's out in the front dancing and conducting the band but um, I'll, play you, I'll play you a little Pres Prado piano tune this one's called, simply called Havana and it's from the 1940s I guess <laughs> Chopsticks, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I love that tune. I always loved that tune. When the first time I heard it, conjures up something so romantically evocative of Havana, or for me, my money for old New Orleans too. Really, um, those changes. <laughs> those changes and those are changes I used to hear when I heard James Booker playing the blues and the funky aspect of it that <laughs> and the question Sonny asked made a reference to Professor Long here it was always obvious to me that there were all these connections but they were very um, 
uh, not very well documented connections, but you could hear it in the music. And it was interesting, a couple of years ago, when I actually um, was asked to play some piano at a little talk they were doing about Professor Long here um, in the grandstand at, at the fairgrounds at Jazz Festival time, and Fess's daughter was there, and Uganda was there, Uganda Roberts, who's, uh, Uganda was the, the uh, percussionist that played with Professor Long here. And he mentioned in an interview that he used to go, and I didn't know this, I just found this out, and then he fell off the chair because it made so that's what I'd always suspected, but it was confirmation. Was he said, yeah, they'd sit round by Fess's house and they'd play Pres Prado records, and it makes perfect sense because what Fess was doing, really, one man on the piano, which is what all piano players do, which is you imitate the band. You've got the bass part, you've got the percussion, what the drums are doing, and then you've got the solos, and you can do it all. And uh, so for that groove, that you know. Funky stuff from first would be. It's the riff, you know, when you go to New Orleans, you see that mile of ground. So I think that's what he was doing. And that's kind of, like I say, I mean, Jelly Roll Morton, I think, did the same thing. And, you know, New Orleans being a, a percussion town. Uh, African Caribbean town wedged on the um, right at the bottom of the of the United States at the Gulf of Mexico. It's the percussion is is the thing that that drives it. It's the engine and um, piano is a percussion instrument, so you feel all that stuff. And when you play a solo gig, and all piano players played solo gigs, um, and they played with bands. And when you're playing with the band, other instruments assume those roles and take the weight off you but if it's just you you have to imply what a whole band is doing and see if you can you know if you can do it right and that's i think what fest did uh, and that's where some of that those caribbean flavors uh can be tasted you know in that in his music so i hope that's a good answer right. to your question here's um a question i don't know if you're going to know this actual um performance that he's referring to but i'll read it anyway cheers um peter hockman first of all can I have some tea? Quarantine? Some quarantine, yeah. Quarantine. Me. You're supposed to have a martini glass there. Yeah, a cup. I have a cup that my mother gave me. Thank you. You good? I'm just going to top up here. Okay, while you're topping up. <laughs> Should have a slice of lemon or something on the With edge milk? of the cup. I would well. curdle the milk. That would be disgusting. <laughs> Um, okay, Peter Hockman says, can you break down Dr. John's iconic intro to Such a Night from his live mountain stage performance? I'd have to hear his live mountain stage performance. Because, um, you know, I played this song a bunch of times with Mac as a guitar player and as a second keyboard player. And uh, he would play it different. He played different versions of it. <clears throat> he used to do this thing I really liked. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love this. It's those changes. It's an F seventh chord. And then the left hand, you go up a half step and play an F sharp seventh. And an interesting thing, in the right hand, you play a different 
chord, different substitution, but it fits. Both chords essentially work together, but they're really different things. In the left hand, as I say, you're going up what's called a half step from F, seventh, using the tenths. Up a half step, and it sounds like this. And you could do the same thing in the right hand, but that would be a bit boring. Sound good, but there's a hipper thing you can do, which is what you do, you go to a five chord. And then you do another thing with a five chord where you raise the fifth note of the five chord, make it an augmented chord, so it sounds like this. And it's the chord that starts, you know, well, tell it like it is, and starts a million. Well, it brings a tear. It's that chord. Like we were talking early on about chords that are loaded with intent. Well, that's, this is a great example. This, the regular chord, sounds like this. And you could play that, but it's static. It's not going anywhere. It just sits there like a bowl of porridge. But you raise this note, and now it's a nice bowl of porridge with some sugar on it. So, in your right hand, you're going essentially from F to its dominant seventh. In this case, not a seventh, it's a sharp five, augmented five. But in the left hand, you're going from the root up a half step, and you put them together, and it sounds like this. And essentially, what you're doing, if uh, I don't want to lose all the listeners who are non musicians, but what you're doing is playing an F sharp seventh chord with a flat five. Seven, and then an, a nine on top. But really, it's an F sharp seven in the left hand, and a C raised five in the in the right. So it goes like this. And this time. Anyway, you could talk all night about all the different uh, tiny little details that where which are you know the, the, the areas where the magic lies and where the mystery lies in this stuff because it's all very mysterious music. No one really knows why these combinations of notes are imbued with certain sexy, uh, mysterious, or sinister qualities. But I think that's probably the aspect of such a night that you were talking about. Because that's just, uh, that's, he would play that as an introduction or in the middle or sometimes at the end um, before he got to the actual song. Anyway. All right. This one, um, and I'm writing these down so I can keep track. So I'm, I don't know if I got your not last name right. But um, this is from Bruce C. Moore. Uh, he says, wasn't your version um, of a cappella, the first one, actually recorded without accompaniment? Did you arrange the harmonies on the piano or on the fly? It was the first one. Um, the, my managers, a little bit of background, my managers at the time had said, why don't you make a record um, of somebody else's material? Which struck me as strange at first, because I... One of the things I do is I write material. So I thought, well, why would I want to do that if I'm already a songwriter? I mean, I like doing covers of other people's songs sometimes, but to do a whole album of, and they, you know, there's a suggestion. They said, why don't you do an album of Elton John songs? And I nearly fell off the chair. <laughs> but in a spirit of uh, cooperation, I thought, well, I, why don't I do an album if you want me to do this? And uh, it seems like a strange idea, but, uh, you know, I'm game. I said, well, let me do an album of Alan Toussaint songs, because as far as I know, no one has ever made a record of Alan Toussaint songs, and he's got a lot of great songs. And um, the time I didn't have a record deal, I didn't have a budget, I didn't have any money to pay musicians with, but I did have the rudiments of a studio at home. And so I thought, well, this would be a good challenge. I'll play all the instruments and have a go, see if I can make a record 
just by myself. And the first um, experiment, the first tune, I thought, let me try one tune and see how I get on, see how I dig it. And so I looked at uh, some of my records and went through my uh, Alan Toussaint, my mental inventory of my favorite Alan Toussaint songs. And it occurred to me, well, a cappella's a tune. It has been covered. I think Ringo Starr covered it, and I think Manhattan Transfer covered it, and maybe somebody else. But I was, couldn't think of anybody that had ever actually done an a cappella version of a cappella. And um, so it started out with finger snaps, and then um, and then I built the, the tune up. And on that song, I got the absolute monster gentlemen, because they're all great singers, as well as being great players. And I wanted to include them on something on this record. So um, <clears throat> I sang all the parts and then brought them in one by one to replace the parts that I'd sang with their voices, thinking actually a blend of more voices would, would give uh, added richness to it. And, um, and I based the arrangement off the details that Alan had used when he arranged it and the, the version, the original version that he cut for Lee Dorsey. So I took that as the template. And um, and it seemed to work pretty good. Mac Rebernack dug it. And he told me he really liked it. And he said he didn't even really like the song, but he liked that, that approach to it and dug the way it worked. So if he liked it, then that was good enough for me. And so I went ahead and did the rest of the record with the help of John Porter, who uh, was there with the con on the controls and making all my madness somehow f fit together and work. And we did a few other tunes. We did Southern Nights. That was the first time I ever played drums on a record. Um, but most the whole album was done here at Funk Headquarters. And um, a cappella, I really liked the way it came out. And I think Alan dug it too. So there you go. That's the answer to your question. Uh, okay, here's one from earlier. Matt Wilson says, how do you leave so much space but still maintain the feel and groove? Well, that's the question, isn't it? How do you do that? I'm still trying to figure that out. Because I like my problem is I just like playing too much. So I want to just, I love the actual turning, pressing record and just playing. I'll play for hours just doing millions of takes. And, you know, it is really hard to restrain yourself. Um, but you have to because it's the air in between the notes that makes the thing rise in the same way as the air in a cake makes it rise. Um, or the air between the twigs in a fire that let it allow it to breathe and, and, and take off when you, when you put the match to it. So it's the same with music and some of the funkiest stuff has really very little going on. And that's always the perennial challenge is to try and get maximum effect with um, the least space being occupied uh, within four beats of a bar. So um, the piano is a good device if you play it regularly because you do have a lot of, so you're working with eight fingers and two thumbs. And you can use all of them, you, know, you, can get, you can get real, real busy, but sometimes you can just, I mean, you know, one guy who was really good at that down here in terms of making records was an old man called uh, Wardell Kazair. And Wardell was fantastic. And he, he, I got to work with him on one tune. He did the arrangements on a, on a tune, on a record of mine. And um, he was not a very well-known name in the New Orleans uh, musical history books, but very, very important. Wardell Kazair was an arranger. He was one of the guys, a bit like Alan Toussaint, who were behind the scenes. You saw their names on the record sleeves if you read the details. And you heard their work, but they weren't the guy that was on the cover. And they weren't the guy who was, had his name all over the posters. But they were the people that really made the records, the very important people, the producers and the arrangers. And um, he's uh, famous in New Orleans for, amongst other things, Big Chief by Professor Longhair on the Watch label. He came up with all those horn arrangements. Um, there was there are two really fantastic tunes that came out in New Orleans that he cut under two different artists on the same session, same four-hour session, uh, when he was cutting for for uh, 
I can't remember what label it was for, but they, he would go to sometimes and get in the car and they'd drive to Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the tunes is Groove Me by King Floyd, which is one of my favorites. And just these riffs, he would come up with these riffs. <laughs> The funkiest stuff is always really basic, but that bass line is so funky and it's so much fun to play. And really, it's the gaps and the holes that are so important. And it's the, if you think in terms of the spaces between notes as being notes themselves, passages of time that allow a song to breathe and present the context in which the, the subsequent notes uh, relate to what's gone before and will relate to what comes afterwards. The other tune from that session I mentioned was Mr. Big Stuff by Gene Knight. Killing, killing, killing. And both of them uh, are perfect examples of using space to make something even funkier. Yeah. Right. It just froze. No, no, we're oh, back. we're back we're on. Back, back. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me think what that might be. Um... Will you get back sure which bit he's talking about but maybe it might be that one. and that's really just it's like playing congas on the piano Tuna thrown in. Maybe it's that bit. Maybe that's what uh, you're referring to. And it's kind of one of those things that if I play it, then it's kind of a no-brainer for me. If I try and slow it down, then I have to start thinking about it and I start making all sorts of stupid mistakes. But, uh, yeah, it's like, playing, it's like playing percussion. Like playing a conga part. Um, Sean Smothers says, you mentioned playing guitar a little earlier, and I've seen the footage of you playing with Medeski, Martin Wood, and Schofield in Japan. Absolutely amazing. Do you find playing guitar or piano as more difficult? Do you compose on both instruments? I do. I have composed on both instruments. I played guitar for years. When I started playing guitar when I was really little and um, played for about 12 or 13, 14 years probably, 
and had the piano at home was always there, and I'd mess around with it and pick out little tunes, but the guitar was the, uh, the tool I used most. And then when I came to New Orleans, I didn't have a guitar, and so there was a piano in the room in the apartment I moved into, and so I, that's when I moved on to, to the piano. And since then, the guitar's taken a bit of a back seat, really, because, you know, it's a lot of stuff to learn a whole new instrument. But I would go back to it often, as, as often as I could. It was almost like uh, to keep it simmering and to keep it boiling. But going to the guitar from the piano um, was was interesting for me because it, you know you suddenly you're used to this romping and it's a giant playground. You've got all this <laughs> huge sonic range and the percussive stuff and all the things you can do on the piano. And you get onto a guitar and it seems like everything's shrunk. Um, but um, and when I got to New Orleans, I started working with a guy called Walter Washington, who's a really good guitar player here in town. A blues guitarist, but with a lot of good knowledge of nice changes. And so he would... Hold on, let me get the guitar up. So with Walter, he would play... He would use all these lovely chords that I didn't know. I'd never really been around anybody that played chords like this, but... That was the plan, and that's why. So my job was to to kind of get on the case quick and learn how these how these chords were voiced on the piano, so that I could keep the gig. Um, and he was playing in very piano unfriendly keys, and so it was very hard for me. And there were no rehearsals, and he would pull songs out that the the rest of the band knew. I was the baby in the band. I just joined, and I was expected to learn them on the gig so i had to really really listen hard um and um then learning getting familiar with these shapes on the piano i would then pick up the guitar and i would think well how do you play that on the guitar because i'd always been really a blues guitarist i'd never really gone to the deep end of all the expensive chords and so that's when i started messing with them and it's very rewarding And so uh, it opened up a whole new area for writing. And so in answer to your question, really, yes, I write on both instruments. And uh, I try and be, I try to be able to move from one to the other. If I have an idea that works on the piano, I'd like to know where my fingers have to go to, to approximate it or play it in a way that works for a guitar um, and vice versa. But they're very different instruments. And um, and for the last few years, I've been playing other instruments too and spending a lot of time learning how to record and using the Pro Tools, using the studio as an instrument too for arranging uh, as a musical device. So um, I wish there were more hours in the day that I could devote to <laughs> all of the instruments. So I've ended up becoming a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none really. But. Uh, here's one from Michael Bursky. He says, when you are improvising, do you see the sounds that your fingers then go and play? I'm amazed at how good the improvising always sounds. Thank you for doing this. Yes, when you improvise, you're spontaneously composing. And in order to do that, um, like a good chess player will think two or three moves ahead, then a good musician will train his... Uh, mental equipment to do the same thing so that you can compose something knowing 
that it's leading towards a point that hasn't actually doesn't actually exist yet, hasn't happened yet. Um, and you can structure a solo and cast your net quite a long way into the future. You can decide, okay, I'm going to build this. And you have these rapid series of mental calculations that, um, that are at work. Um, and, you know, sometimes you improvise better than others. Some improvisers are better than others. But when you're doing this, you're not just pulling notes at random. The notes that you select are usually drawn from a se complex series of frameworks and patterns that you're already familiar with. The most obvious one being the basic chord progression that you're soloing over. And then all the passing chords that you will use in that four bars or eight bars or 12 bars. And then all the different inversions of those passing chords and then all the different substitutions that you could make at any point. Chords which contain some of the same elements, but some different elements too. And then you can hold all that information in your head and grab and select, like you're picking apples from the tree. And you weave them all together into a seamless thread. But it's done in real time, and you're always a few steps ahead of the people that are at, that are at the receiving end. And... Um, Sometimes you can kind of go on automatic pilot a little bit and depends if you're soloing over a blues progression, for example, you could just string together a bunch of riffs that you've played a million times and you sew them up and it tells a story. Uh, when you start improvising over jazz changes, um, then you can set yourself uh, a more complicated task. And uh, the fun is when you're playing is to be ambitious and uh, really the fun part for most musicians is to try and do something that's a little bit more ambitious than they can actually manage so you do stumble but that's really when you're you're flying by the skin of your teeth and if you ever watch John Schofield solo you can look at his facial expressions I mean it's, it's uh, it looks like agony <laughs> <laughs> the best music, I think I do it the same too. All of my favourite musicians, when you watch them play, it looks like they're being tortured or something. <laughs> it doesn't look like a very pleasant experience, but it is kind of agonising because you're digging really, really deep and there's a sense of panic because you've got to pull it off. And uh, the good ones are the ones that go right up to the edge and you can fall off at any minute and make a complete fool of yourself. But the best mu best ones will do that, but they're also another thing that you're very, you have to be very good at when you're improvising is when you do make a mistake, which you will do if you're good, is making it look like you actually meant it. And then uh, <laughs> it's how you get out of your, your mistakes that really separates the men from the boys, I think. So there you go. So you might have to um, pick up the guitar again. Um, and Tom, Tom Pragliola says, please play Bad News. He made another post earlier asking for it. And uh, yeah, people are liking the guitar. So Bad News. OK. <clears throat> yeah. I forgot to get a pick. Oh. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Can you actually see this? I guess you can. <laughs> bad News. So. Uh, Shift yourself a little bit. Well, I've got to still talk into the mic, so it's a bit difficult. Mm. Anyway. So bad news has this chord progression. Kind of the, I was talking about the Walter Washington chord. Walter, like Johnny Guitar Watson and all those cats, was very influenced by Wes Montgomery. Wes Montgomery famously would play octaves. favorite guitar players that used that style was a guy called Little Beaver, Willie Hale, who's uh, still around from uh, Miami. I think he was from Arkansas originally, but lives in Miami. Little Beaver, why well, I used to spend a 
lot of time and money trying to track down rare little beaver records before the internet. But, um... And so there's a riff. Well, now, bad news this morning. I don't want to get you all down. Sweep it back under the rug, y'all. Let's make like it never went down. Good news. Seem like it don't want to come my way. Scared to wake up in the morning. Make a start on a brand new day. Well, bad news. Getting so tired of just singing the blues. I don't want to hear about a thing gone wrong I, I'd rather be singing my joyful song Something like that. Bad news. So, um, Tim Penn tells us that Sweet Emma would have been 123 years old yesterday. So, can you play whenever you're lonesome? Yeah. This question is about Sweet Emma the Bell Girl. And the first time I heard Sweet Emma the Bell Girl on a record was when my uncle played it for my grandma on a record, yeah, live at Preservation Hall. I think it was the live at Preservation Hall LP. One of the, some, one of the many records he brought back from New Orleans after having lived there for a number of years. And, um, and so I really learned it from him playing it and singing it. Um, but I was lucky when I arrived in New Orleans, Sweet Emma was still playing and I did go and see her play at the Preservation Hall on St. Peter Street in the French Quarter. And um, and th that song was the one that always stuck in my mind. So let's see if I have a good key for this. Well, now, I'm changing all the keys. And normally when I'm on a gig, when I'm singing, I've been, you know, up all kind of on stage and there's people and lights and bands loud and everything. And you, all your singing equipment is charged up and pumped up. Here I am sitting quietly at home and I'm going to find a nice key to sing it so it works. And if my mum's listening, this one's going out, this one's for you, mum. Mm, whenever you're lonesome Just telephone me When you're all on your own soon. You leave sweet company When the blues overtake you I'll never forsake you You know your heart will be waiting Oh baby for you A world be the finest from Frisco to me Don't be upset at the news Cut me loose Oh, with a sofa song But don't play No Frenchman Street Blues
I did my time all in that masquerade. And I ran the rough and the smooth. Canvas of peace of mind. Don't play. No, don't play. Don't play. Next week. Good night, John Boy. <laughs>